This is a tutorial based on a study on the life cycle of a common cultivated fern called a sea fern. This was a project for Ken Cameron's course on plant morphology and evolution at the University of Wisconsin. Here's what inspired the study. Plants undergo a remarkable back and forth between two life cycle phases. One is haploid with half the chromosome count and the other diploid with paired chromosomes. In ancient plants like mosses, the haploid phase predominates and the other phase is like a minor appendage. The opposite is true in more recently evolved plants like flowering plants. The diploid phase predominates and the other phase is relatively inconspicuous. Ferns occupy the middle ground. Both phases are free living and relatively easy to observe and sea ferns in particular undergo their entire life cycle in as little as three months which makes them really convenient experimental subjects. Finally, a pervasive question for all living things is how they keep themselves from inbreeding and losing genetic diversity. I'm going to begin with uh, some visuals of the early development of sea ferns. Uh, here you have a spore and uh, you'll notice a, a what we call a, a trilete mark. Um, this is an artifact of the early development of spores. A single cell divides twice to create four cells and they form themselves into a pyramid. The trilate mark is the scar that's left behind when that, when that pyramid separates into the four spores. A few days after sowing you can see this spore here opening along three seams that are defined by its former trilete mark. Then uh, a couple of weeks later a spore, and here you can see a spore on the left hand side, has developed into this gametophyte. Uh, gametophytes um, have uh, both male and female organs. They're known as hermaphrodites. And here you see uh, these dark spots here. These are the female organs called archegonia. And each archegonium will produce one egg. The male organs are scattered elsewhere in the gametophyte. They're not highly visible in this uh, particular photograph. Um, and they're called antheridia. And each antheridium will produce lots and lots of sperm. Uh, the sperm's job is to swim uh, and find eventually an archegonium and work its way down to the egg in the archegonium and fertilize the egg. So what we've been talking about is part of this cartoon life cycle from the spore to the gametophyte and its components, its organs, uh, and then um, they will eventually both the, 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 the male and female, the sperm and the egg will find will will uh, become a fertilized zygote um, and our study is going to concentrate on this part that we discussed um, but uh, since these are ferns you should be aware that um, the what eventually happens is that that zygote develops into what we call a sporophyte and the sporophyte uh, is what everyone thinks of as what a, uh, what a fern should look like. Now um, you'll find countless versions of this same cartoon on the internet. It turns out that they're all wrong. Um, the, uh, the gameta, this is an oversimplification. In, in the 1950s, um, some 20 species were found to, fern species were found to produce not just hermaphrodites, but also male gametophytes. The male gametophytes, as the name suggests, it produces only antheridia and no archegonia. Furthermore, the hermaphroditic gametophytes were found to emit a pheromone, which, when a developing gametophyte uh, detected, would tend to uh, cause that gametophyte to develop into a male gametophyte and not a hermaphroditic gametophyte. Um, 
This has a uh, benefit, um, it confers a, a genetic advantage on this hermaphroditic gametophyte, namely um, that it's encouraging more males and therefore more sperm to be produced by spores that are likely to be less closely related to the spore from which it itself emerged. Uh, and that uh, increases its, the, its genetic, genetic diversity as opposed to if it were fertilized by a spore from its own gametophyte, then um, that obviously produces less genetic diversity. So I'm going to show you now a photograph of a male gametophyte. Um, and uh, you can see it being produced, it was produced from this spore here. And each of these little nodules are antheridia. Um, and the antheridia are what uh, will uh, dehiss and produce sperm. Um, so when you put all these biological elements that we've been talking about together, you can see them all in this picture here. Here is a, a typical um, sea fern hermaphrodite. Here is a male, and here's a, sper a spore. Um, and um, one thing to observe here is that the, uh, the hermaphrodite is quite a bit larger than the male. Another thing to observe is that the hermaphrodites typically form this sort of cardioid shape. All right, so if you take everything I've told you about so far and try to imagine uh, uh, an experiment that would teach us something about the, uh, this, this pheromone, um, what we could do is uh, try sowing spores at different densities into different plates. Um, here's a high density and here's a low density. What we would expect is for the high density plates that the early emerging gametophytes, being hermaphroditic, would emit their pheromone and uh, encourage um, the subsequently developing gametophytes to uh, become male gametophytes and not hermaphroditic gametophytes. And therefore, in these denser plates, we would expect a, uh, a higher proportion of males to uh, hermaphrodites. Um, Whereas in the uh, in the sparse plates, um, there there the reach of the pheromone may be too little uh, to to uh, affect um, the far removed, far distant uh, gametophytes to cause them to become males. So the experiment uh, uh, experimental procedure is to do the the uh, growing sowing and growing, and then to do a lot of counting. And uh, I'm not going to um, uh, uh, describe the trials and tribulations of counting, but you can imagine you have to count spores, you have to count both male and hermaphroditic gametophytes, and then you have to do the math. Um, but if you're interested in that, um, the, uh, uh, the methods are described in the appendix which of uh, this presentation, which you can download um, if you wish. Uh, so I, instead, I'm going to jump directly to the analysis of the data. Here we see the gametophyte ratio, male to hermaphrodite, as a function of the spore density. So as spore density increases, the proportion of males also increases, which is what we had expected. I'm also going to show you a second conclusion, which was a little bit more surprising. Uh, but before I do that, I want to point out one uh, vulnerability uh, when you try to count um, the gametophytes. And that is that uh, you recall that, uh, that gametophytes, hermaphroditic gametophytes, are larger than male gametophytes. Therefore, a hermaphroditic gametophyte could be large enough to conceal underneath it one or more male gametophytes. And that would result in undercounting the male gametophytes. So you can imagine perhaps that the, the real count of male gametophytes might be even higher, pushing this ratio even higher than what you're seeing here. Um, the second conclusion that I alluded to is this. 
as the density increases, the germination rate decreases. There's some kind of population pressure that uh, this is uh, showing us. And um, it would be nice to know what that mechanism is. Uh, I don't have the answer. Uh, but uh, at least the, uh, uh, the statistics uh, imply that this is probably the case and um, it would merit further investigation. Um, the same data vulnerability occurs here, however, which is that, again, I'll just repeat it to be clear, if the, uh, the, female, the hermaphroditic gametophyte being larger, if it conceals underneath it male gametophytes, then we're going to undercount male gametophytes. And if we undercount male gametophytes, we're going to undercount the germination rate. So the actual germination rate here might be a little bit higher than what we're seeing here. So you can also observe this empirically just by looking in your plates and uh, looking for spores that didn't make it. Here's a sad spore that didn't make it. Um, he dehissed, but he was unable to produce any viable contents. Um, so that's uh, a, a, um, you know one one example of a germination uh, that failed. I'm going to wrap up with. Uh, some questions that emerged uh, uh, during the during the uh, during the study. Um, I'm only going to cover uh, the first three of these. The first one is um, why is it that when we observe sporophytes emerging from these gametophytes, that we generally see only one robust, healthy sporophyte? Um, how does the uh, that sporophyte suppress the uh, other uh, fertilized zygotes that are in other archegonia. Second question is, uh, what happens to the antheridia on this gametophyte after fertilization of these archegonia? Um, you can imagine two scenarios. One is that these archegonia are rather selfish, and the one they they or the one that's dominant um, represses those antheridia so that uh, it can conserve the energy within this gametophyte to produce a more robust sporophyte. Another scenario you can imagine is a more altruistic scenario where the, uh, the fertilized archegonia or fertilized zygotes uh, or eggs um, it will permit the uh, antheridia to develop further so that they can emit sperm and go on uh, and let the and those sperm can go on and swim to reach uh, other uh, archegonia and fertilize other eggs on other gametophytes. Um, the third question is, um, if you observe the development of your uh, gametophytes, um, you'll see that in the early stages they're often asymmetric um, in the shape of a mitten. Uh, whereas in the later stages, they take more and more a symmetric cardioid shape that we saw earlier. So the question is, um, are the mittens that you see early on predominantly left-handed or right-handed mittens? Uh, what's the proportion of left-handed or right-handed mittens? And what governs that proportion? So that uh, concludes the, the slides uh, that I wanted to present to you. Um, and um, again, uh, if you're interested in, um, in uh, any more details, uh, you can download the full slide deck. Um, thanks for watching.